Back in the 1970s, I was doing what most young guys doing. Um, finished just playing football. Still passionate about my uh, camping and generally just outdoor activities. I was I had a few mates and we thought we'd have a crack at what Sam Harding wasn't that much known about it back then. And information, virtually none. It's a very secret society, virtually. So there was more trial and error when we were doing our hunting. By the 1980s, we were having some success. We were learning more about the Samba, all by ourselves. We weren't even members of a, a deer hunting club or anything. By the 1990s, I was um, producing videos because the first thing I was before I was even a hunter was a photographer. Doing weddings and uh, just just a lot on wildlife, but uh, the cameras uh, technology wasn't that good, so that virtually had to be very skilled to even be a photographer back then. Not like today with all the technology. Um, yeah, so sit back and enjoy. Okay, well, Sam stalking to me is. Uh, is uh, the pinnacle of um, of hunting in Victoria. This head uh, was taken in 1989 uh, on a backpack trip when we first started. So this this head is uh, it's got a lot of memories, and even though it's uh, close to 33 years ago, um, I still remember it vividly. It was back in the times when the semi-automatics were uh, uh, were illegal, and uh, as we know with Port Arthur, um, they made them illegal, so everyone's changed to just a recreational hunting rifle, bolt action. And um, yeah, but I first started hunting back in 1981, so that was 40, 40, 41 years ago. And there's a stag that's not here now, it's uh, all over the place at the moment, but uh, I had, didn't have enough room from the ones I've taken, so it was sort of, um, I gave it to a guy and, and he, I think he gave it to another guy, so it's done more travelling uh, than it was when it was alive, so yeah, so this was in the basin and around Mount Bon, bon Garrard. Um, Ray and I did several several trips there one year and uh, just to learn recon and we found out there was there was a populace of uh, good samba in the area and then we the next year in I think that was 88 and 89 we started hunt fairly solid did a few trips every trip was successful not that we took a, a stag but we seen a lot of animals and that was probably the catalyst for me to take up filming. And I re just remember one early morning I'd come to a wallow, I could hear noises, and I walked up and here's a stag, not, not very big, probably about 25, but beautiful head. Um, and I just always loved my photography, and, and that was probably the catalyst to why, where I am today with my filming and, and my photography. Now I don't hunt with a rifle, as I see. So, and around the room, if I go over to to my um, right, um, there's a few good heads here too. A different take. We used to, Ray and I used to um, work on the precedence of taking one stag a year. It wasn't one stag per trip, and so a lot of times we just did fishing and and photography. So. That, uh, with me, I, I did a lot of photography of deer. And say, so, um, I'll pan over this side. Here we are in this corner. Got some beautiful heads. That's 30 inch I was taken on a one and club trip in uh, May 1997. And the one below it, um, it was a hunt with um, a couple of mates, Klaus Beck and uh, Dave Cunningham. Uh, virtually, those two did coming out of the same area because I know I know that that area very well. 
well and knew how where they were and how to hunt it. Uh, just recently I went in there and didn't see any stags, but um, got some good footage of a spiky and um, it's not all about stags to me, it's generally photographing whatever. Um, in 2000, I think 2000, I, I filmed a hind from about 10 feet away. Um, but, or modding the enclosures, you can almost hit me with a hook, which I'll, I'll show in this, this beginning part one. And this is this is um, an antler that went 33. You see, but going back, you can see where he lost it. I'd like to see him in his prime, maybe two or three years before that. He, younger animal, fitter, but he was going back. And uh, we actually took this animal. A friend of mine took this animal, Mario was his name. And I found both cast animals. He's got the other one and I've got this one. But uh, definitely he wants this one back. So, uh, but yeah, you can see the heaviness of it. It's a bit like that other big slingshot top, so it's got the weight. But, um, The tips of as far as hunting is um, hunted for good times. Um, deer o'clock, simple. Normally that's at daybreak when the light, light is good enough to hunt or even leave before daybreak to get into your area to hunt because these deer are moving back by then. And um, you always find deer will move back and Later on in the year, like as I say, it's July, the, the stags are starting to get. Some are in velvet at, velvet at the moment. We've seen a few in velvet um, the other week. And, um, but some are in hard antler. I filmed, filmed one the other day in hard antler, which I'll probably show to you later. But um, yes, very memorable trip. And, uh, on that 30 inch, it was, as I say, a club trip. I'd, and that was another thing, I've seen that stag, I tried to get another guy onto that stag, he would have been 28, and I'd say he's the same stag, he had the same looks, unless he's got a twin brother. But um, he just, you couldn't get better first symmetrical as, as that one. You can even the bottom one, like the brows were perfectly even. And that's what I went for. I, I've seen a lot of heads, big heads over the years and I remember one big head I seen that had it broken in the top and uh, I could have taken him but I elected not to because he had that broken in it. Um, and one of my friends ended up taking him on a, on a backpack trip. Yeah, it's a red chittle. It, to me, they look, they're good to, to hunt. Um, they're, they're definitely different than the sandbar because you've got normally all well, the red, reds are in the raw so they're those sweet. You can raw them, you can bring them in. You can raw a sander in too. Um, I do it vocally by my mouth. I don't use any any electronic devices. Like back in those days, there was um, yeah, you couldn't you couldn't call them back. But um, a lot of people didn't believe it um, until they seen your footage and they, they go, wow. Uh, it can be called, and um, I, when I've, I've done talks at uh, different associations, I've, I've sort of let the cat out of the bag here and call it with him out. Um, there's a few other electronic aids, but to me that's not honey, um, caught, to bring it in, but I never never took a stag if I could call it, uh, these are all hunted, and that was the way I am. It's um, why these, why they are quality hunts to me, memorable. Till the day I die, I'll still remember it. So, um, and the thirty inches is probably more memorable because I was with a lot of good guys, and yeah, I just remember before I got home, everyone knew I'd shot it, shot this thirty inch. That was how back in them days. So the thirty inch was, it was like hen's teeth. It, ah, you know. Or, um, I shot a lot of animals around that 29, 28 mark that, that, that had good shape and every head I've got here is completely different. I always look for something different. I always love the overspread but 
Um, that one there is 30 by 30 by 30, or well, was back in 97. Uh, uh, I don't shoot stags in velvet. Uh, it's my own personal privilege to do that. I, I said I, I've never seen a really... I've seen stags in velvet when they're first mounted and they look pretty good, but um, give it um, 12 to 24 months and then nothing like it, unless you get it in hard antlers and stripping it off. That looks quite good. So uh, you get the full potential of the animal when it's in hard antler. I see, um, I've seen a lot of deer shot over the years, just in holes, you know, that could have been something like that. Um, yeah, I'm very um, particular on, on certain animals and as I said, a few of these animals I used to see over the period of time. Um, I've got smaller stags in here when I first started hunting. Um, this one was in the corner here. I'll t pan it around in a minute. But that was taken in uh, nine, 1990, I think, this one here. That one was on, um, I, I wasn't going to take this animal, but a, a taxidermist, you know, not Chris, but Charlie wanted to do a mount. He was, he was experimenting with this semi-sneak mount, mate, but this one was sniffing. He wanted that one of the heads, so get honked at. And, and that is, once you sort of got onto a stag, you, you, were, uh, you could really concentrate without being spooking other deer, because they weren't as... Uh, thick in numbers, so um, yeah, uh, there's, there's uh, they're all different. Every every stag I've taken is different. All pretty good, like big brows, nice tops, and there's a 30 30 inch over there. I've got a few 30 inches out in the shed that I didn't get mounted. As I said, um, I had a a mate of mine who, well, he's a taxidermist and we were sort of, we worked well together and we did a few expos, I was doing videos back in in the 90s um, and we did a few expos and he was doing taxidermist and I was doing the videos and there was not, not much on Samba at the time. You know, the only way you could learn is either through um, a stalking organisation or association or ADA and then, then there was other branches sort of formed over those years. Um, so uh, that was probably, if I was saying, if I was an inexperienced hunter or getting into hunting now, I'd probably join some sort of a club. Because um, that's where you're going to get information, you're going to meet the best hunters going around. Um, all these deer, the, the boys, I've been just one on one it's that's what I love about the hunting it's um, to get in, in as close as possible um, and take these stags you know without them they know they, they know you're there but as you're hunting you you you've got to just uh, I mean, something you experience over years sometimes it doesn't work but um, hunting is a a primal instinct. We're all different as hunters and deer are different too. They're different intellect too. Some of these animals are very smart. This one here, I've seen him the year before and uh, and this one I've seen the year before too, in about 14 k's from where actually where I actually took him. So they're, they're probably the most elusive um, deer in well, arguably in, in, in the world, but definitely in Australia. Um, and a big animal like this can hide in, in a bit of thick bush and you don't see, you can be 10 feet away from it and you won't see it. You're just looking for a, an, an ear or just like this one here. Just, and that, as I said, um, it's waiting for a twitch or a, a movement of the antler at the top or a branch. You may know exactly where the deer is, but you can't see him. And, and there's no point in taking a, taking a risky shot at a, at, at a deer. I always made sure that uh, I identified the target, especially these days with the amount of hunters. And this is just something that doesn't um, happen overnight. It's 
a progression of 40 years. Um, and in that, these only just some of the references, there's not just the deer I see, I'd, I'd hate to think how many stags I've seen over the years. You know, some, now there's more deer around, you see a lot of uh, juvenile animals, you, very hard to see these selected, because they don't get that chance to grow now. Um, a lot of these wouldn't make this reach, this, this, this animal might have been taken to juvenile. Um, you're not going to see the potential of what this mature animal is. But in saying that, um, uh, with, if we had good game management in Australia, well, that would be the case. In America, uh, the, the juveniles that get shot, would um, you'd be in jail. But um, I'm, I, I don't want to deny anyone from hunting, you know, like, but there's, there's so much potential out there. And, and if you want to get, get a good stag, like you know, a big trophy stag, You've got to put in the hard yards, if you're a hunter, so to speak. Um, as I said, uh, as I said, with me, I, I love to hunt solo. I, I might camp with, we go backpack and we camp together, but we never hunted together. We just went out different ways. Where, where are you going to hunt? Um, we tee it up at that night. Which way are you going to be? So we knew exactly where we were. And um, there was always those safety precautions. It's, and, and if someone did take a shot, we, we knew exactly where they were. Um, back in the early days, we didn't have radios. So that was another thing. We didn't have radios back then. So, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, I was out of the picture. But, yeah, and now I don't carry a rifle with me. I do mainly uh, photography um, and filming a bit. And it's not just about deer. Um, I just love the wildlife that we have in Australia, um, and there's, sometimes I'll, I might go up the bush and see a few deer, that's fine, but I might be on another objective to film some native birds, um, give it a few more months, we're in September when, when there's going to be a fair bit of activity with the stags. Um, I'll most be likely, likely uh, photographing birds or raptors or even the odd fox or even a dingo or whatever. Um, that's what it what it's about to me. It's just um, creating that vortex in nature that I love the most. Um, camping, uh, just uh, the backpacking days. For ten years, I I backpacked on my own, but. Um, my, these guys might not b b believe this, but I was just learning about deer. I, um, learning is trying to s get as much information about what about the deer. And um, I don't say I know everything, but I know a bloody lot. Um, where to find these deer and how do they react? And they're all different. They all got different personalities. Um, if they get wind of you or smell you or hear you, they they do. It draw the dots together and with um, I'm doing a, this little bit um, talk about cameras now um, at the beginning what I started with well I haven't got all the cameras that I started with but I got some of the cameras from the state of the art what we got now to uh, what I used to shoot with and I even got even more of an arcade camera which I haven't got but this is what I used to use back in the early 1990s and before that it was a Sony Handycam Video 8 These I say the batteries on it but it's been sitting around for 30 years and I can't even open it now oh, It's not even on Maybe I'll try and recharge it but that's what I used to shoot with and um, it was the old power system, and I'll go into that, what, what the difference was to what we got today with the LAK videos, or 4K videos, that most people use, but now we're going to 8K. And the resolution, I'll give you a sample of what we were up against. And now these cameras are quite a good lens, but the uh, processor was very slow. Compression lines in your footage, and the chromatic aberration was pretty pretty infectious in, in your footage back then, but back 30 years ago we were watching black and white, well, 40 years ago we were watching black and white TV, so 
the progression was at that time was pretty amazing. But uh, we can't stop technology, and what's happened now is we've gone from that. And then by early '99s, I went went with this. I did this one because I was doing a lot of backpacking, and weight was was a really an issue. And by having this, which did photos and video, same issue. It went to high definition. Um, the chromatic aberration, distortion in the footage, and you'll see that as you'll see the progression through the videos. Through when I do, when I finish the beginning, then I'll, I'll go into advancements in photography and what our footage is today, and a lot of stuff on YouTube um, that's being presented is done with either cameras like that or or proper professional video cameras. Even our mobile phones now uh, is a multi-purpose in call, and it does amazing photos uh, and and video. And I see guys using gimbals. Well, that's another thing. Back in there, we didn't have what vibration reduction in those. Where in a lot of the modern cameras, you've got vibration reduction. Uh, Auto focus was so much superior. With even with these, you had to manually focus and. The first one I bought was fairly expensive and then they sort of, as they got more popular with these small compact cameras that um, I got to start to get cheaper. The megapixels on well, the first one I had was one, um, 1.3 megapixels. Now these cameras here, this one here does close to 48 megapixels, if not maybe a bit more. Even the footage on this, photos on this in JPEG or RAW is quite good. Um, but you see the difference in, the, in, in this camera to that camera because uh, the crispness and the sharpness is, and the detail is so much superior to even the bridge camera. And I um, th just wanted to show you what the progression has been with those over the years. As I said, when I started filming, there was only two or three guys filming at the time, and and that was how it was. There wasn't many deer around. The populace of Samba uh, wasn't like it is today, where Samba are widespread. So it was very challenging, especially when you were photographing, because you could walk all day and not see bugger all. Where today, if, uh, I don't go out and see maybe 20 or 30 deer uh, in a day. Uh, yeah, finding pockets of them, still known to where to get the footage of something like uniquely like these stags. Uh, we, it was good back then because there wasn't as many hunters either, so we were, we were allowed to see these stags over years grow and only then we could get footage like this where today the abundance of hunters uh, or deer are getting shot. A lot of them don't reach maturity. They shot about four or five year old where we used to let those stags go. Um, and you can see here, you can see the connection I'm trying to make, the interaction where I, I'm holding this deer with curiosity. Uh, turning back to me because it's trying to figure out what, I'm, what I am. They understand uh, that you're a threat to them. There's been isolated cases where the tables have been turned where actually I've had deer follow me just in curiosity. They're a wonderful creature, intelligent, just doing what they do best, uh, procreate, breed. As I said, in the gardeners of the bush where our government at this point in time reckons they're a vermin but they're doing more good for the environment and what the human race is doing for our environment. Uh, but that's pretty hard to convince the, the government to listen to the stakeholders of the bush or, or Alpine National Park, our parks are meaningful infiltrated by Greens. A majority, there's some good people in there. But as I said, I 
spoke about that numerous times. We do don't, minimal game management. Well, they seem to say, yeah, you're apart, but we're not going to do bugger all for you. Whereas if you're in Europe or in in the United States or any other country where they revere the game, you know, well, they're not a game anymore. They once upon a time were. They put them on the ferro list. So that gives... Uh, it's created a monster because you, you see now we are hunter gatherers. I won't go into too much on government because you can see what's happening to the world at the moment. Uh, we are self sufficient in a lot of ways, even though we, we still have our vehicles, we have our camping equipment, which we, we buy out of our own hard earned money. Um, the government don't realise that. The majority of four-wheel drives in Victoria that, uh, are owned by by fishermen, uh, hunters, and just general outdoor outdoorsmen type people that love camping and that. And uh, there's so uh, it sort of upsets me a little bit when I talk about government at the moment because we see what they're doing to the deer with the. Uh, aerial culling in areas of Alpine National Park, which is not really doing any any anything really. It's just wasting taxpayers' money. Um, we're seeing what it's doing to the waterways. It's uh, contaminating our streams because they leave the carcasses there to rot. Um, the only one that's probably benefited a little bit from it is probably dingoes and uh, raptors. But other than that, um, not really, because the disease goes into our waterways. I, I don't hate to be going to an area where they've culled animals and just uh, the drink of water. You, you, you'd have to make sure you boil it because there's a good chance that you will get very sick. Uh, that's never been brought in consideration. They will never have spoke, spoke to the stakeholders, us as hunters, or uh, any... If they have spoken to uh, associates, because I'm not a member anymore, but um, it's sad. It's it's for what we we where we come from. I think we we talk about the good old days, and um, they were the good old days. We didn't have the interference by minority groups or um, blatant mistakes by the government. Uh, but in saying that. You as a hunter, you are a person and you must have people that... that we, we, have, we are a, a majority of people, but we don't seem to do much at all. What you're seeing now is what I enjoy the most here. The footage you're seeing here is a pine was filmed in 2000 um, where I'm interacting with the hind from, uh, I'd say, about... 12 feet away, you can see a young calf. She's very protective. That's why she's um, warning to go any closer. So the animal is very protective. This is footage on the old power system um, video cams. It, at that time, it was brilliant. You know, as I said, um, we've come a long way. Uh, now, in, so this was power, it's only like it. Uh, very small pixel eight, pixel resolution where today we're running 8K. I hate to think in another five years we were probably running uh, 12K, I don't know. Uh, and this is what we used to do. do. Um, even the photography saw aspects has improved that so much now. We're back, back in these days, we are using film cameras. Uh, so you, you have to wait for the processing and a lot of the photos you're seeing here are, may have just started in just the digital age. That was around, uh, yeah, as I say, 1995 we started digital. So we we're going into digital uh, photography and videography. And yeah, this was taken on the old power system, this footage. It used a brilliant camera at the time, it was a uh, Sony Handycam. Uh, yeah, but it's been the journey and, um, yeah, a lifelong journey. And as I said, uh, thanks for watching it and um, 
I hope you get some satisfaction and education out of it, as we did, as I say. Um, and I look forward to doing the next uh, video, which will be Sam Stalking Part 2, which will be, I won't be the beginning, because this is the beginning, but uh, the journey. I'll call it probably the journey. Uh, and you'll see better footage as, as we progress through the years. Okay, thanks for watching. Enjoy.